Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am coordinator, or well, I'm no longer coordinator now. I'm chief knowledge broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And I'd like to welcome you all today to today's webinar. Um, we are very glad to have Chloe King um, who did this work that she's gonna be talking about while she was at the University of Cambridge. We're very glad um, to have her here today. She's gonna be speaking on turning the tide, unlocking the potential of seagrass ecosystems through locally led valuation approaches. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you all know how to ask questions. You, um, Chloe will be presenting first, and then uh, we'll have dedicated time for question and answer at the end of the webinar. Um, we encourage you to send in questions whenever you think of them. You can send them either through the question panel of the webinar or through the chat interface. Um, the question panel is a little easier for us to moderate, but the chat um, as a benefit that if you want to, you can also oh, share it with everyone there. Um, we're happy for people to use the chat for interactive discussion on this topic. Um, so feel free to put in questions that you think other audience members could address uh, or comments and resources that you know of that are relevant. We just ask that anything you put in the chat that you um, keep it on the subject matter and keep it professional. Um, thank you very much to everyone for being here and I'll turn it over to Chloe now. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. And um, yeah, really delighted to see the interest in this webinar. Um, I want to, to start this by caveating and saying that um, I am, am not necessarily a seagrass expert or a seagrass scientist. Um, you know, I did this research as part of my, my master's in conservation leadership at the University two years ago. Um, and I am now or with my, my placement host, uh, Blue Ventures, who hopefully we have some, um, some members in, in the audience as well, which would be great. Um, I'm currently now a PhD researcher uh, still at, at Cambridge and um, based here in the Galapagos Islands. And my, my background and expertise is actually in, um, in tourism and, and how do we sort of approach tourism in, in a new way and, and in a more regenerative way. So um, this was a, a big kind of uh, left turn for me in my, in my master's, and, um, but I'm excited to share the results with, with everyone and, and, and talk a little bit about this, this work and, and some recommendations for conservation practitioners in the field. Um, but yes, uh, given my my location in the world, I apologize if there's any internet connectivity issues. I've told Sarah to interrupt me if um, I, I uh, go out for any moment and then we'll go back and, and review whatever is needed. Um, but yeah, so just to begin, um, I'll, I'll go through a bit, a, a deep dive into the research that I did and, and the approach that I used. Um, but ultimately, I, I want to conclude and, and really spend more time in the presentation talking about some of the discussion questions and that arose and, and the recommendations for conservation practitioners in the field. So to begin, um, I wanted to highlight this report that I'm sure many of those in the audience have already seen or read. Um, which is the Intergovernmental, Panis uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Whew, that's a mouthful. Um, but IPBES published this report in 2022, um, which was their, their values typology report, which uh, found that there are over 50 methods for valuing nature. Um, and this was by over 80 scientists over four years using more than 13,000 sources. And the valuation process. Um, so I read this in, in 2022 and found, um, you know, was really was really shocked by this report and and really quite, um, uh, you know, it was very illuminating to me as I was going into this work with Blue Ventures and was that you, Sarah, saying that? Am I cutting out? I didn't. I didn't say anything. There is. There are some glitches, but I think we we can just go on ahead. Okay, <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, so yeah, so this report was was really fascinating and and illuminated the importance of these locally led valuation approaches. 
and we all know uh, those of us working within the the carbon financing or or conservation and, and blue carbon space, um, we know that demand is high and that better solutions are needed. Um, so 30% of the 2.4 billion people living near the ocean are dependent upon ecosystem services. 51% um, of asset managers are seeking investment in blue carbon, and this is probably higher now than it than it is it was two years ago when when I saw the statistic. Um, and there's overall an 8.1 trillion dollar investment needed in nature-based solutions by 2030. But really, what are the solutions that we are offering here? Um, ultimately, uh, I, I really love this quote by, by Silvertown in his article in 2015, which talked about how ecosystem services have evolved from a metaphor to a tradable commodity in which valuing nature has become synonymous with monetizing it. And I think we have, uh, in many cases, forgotten the really diverse number of valuation approaches that are possible um, in the work that we do. There's about, uh, there was about 36 to $42 billion spent on payments for ecosystem service projects annually um, with the voluntary carbon market exceeding about $1 billion in 2020. But the social institutions that govern comparable resources, such as fisheries or many of the marine resources that we work in, are fundamentally seats of non-market relationships. Um, this was highlighted in the Economics of Biodiversity Report that I just skipped a review in 2021, um, which was a quote I found highly ironic because it was at the very end of the report after an entire you know 200 some pages had been dedicated to the importance of placing monetary valuations on nature. Um, but really left it to the final chapter to discuss the additional valuation approaches that are possible um, and, and really how do we how do we make sure that we're crowding in or we're actually um, in enabling and enforcing these intrinsic motivations for conserving these spaces and not crowding them out and not allowing monetary valuation to, to drive out these, these motivations. Just a quick review for those, I'm sure many of you are aware of this already, um, but in terms of, of how we value ecosystem services, um, we have this indicator of total economic value, which includes use value and non-use value. Um, this includes direct use and indirect use, so consumption or life support values such as carbon storage or, or fishing. Um, and then it also includes, include, includes non-consumption and physical protection. Um, some of these elements are more uh, or, or are more commonly measured within market trends. So for example, it's much easier to measure uh, and quantify the value of carbon storage than it is to measure and value the, uh, the ability of ecosystems to protect coastlines. Um, and that the fact that one has a market value and the other doesn't um, does not reflect the actual value of these ecosystems in in terms of monetary um, monetary terms, but it just reflects the fact that we have a international carbon market that is able to put a value and a price on on these services. But there are also these non-use values, this notion of existence value or option value, bequest value um, that are generally not understood or well utilized or well um, well valued within within the literature, which is um, really interesting. And of course, this this whole field of ecosystem services valuation is a very uh, it's a very rich space in the literature. It's a very very hotly contested space. So I'm sure this um, that this this graphic is probably uh, has been redone a million other ways uh, as well. So this is not necessarily the, the definitive only only answer here. But I guess the question that I wanted to, to really ask was how can we hope to demonstrate the value of nature to people if we're really only telling half of the story, if we're not counting the values of the people who are truly stewarding these ecosystems? So the way that I did this was by asking um, one primary research question, which is how can nature-based solutions and seagrass ecosystems in particular be more effectively valued, financed, and implemented at the local scale? 
I did this through three primary data collection methods. Um, the first was a systematic map of 56 studies that used evaluation approaches. Um, I conducted surveys with 60 ecosystem-based project managers and local community implementers and conducted expert reviews with 24 experts in a wide range of fields. So in fields of NBS financing, uh, PES implementation, voluntary carbon markets. Um, so particularly the surveys and the interviews were not just focused only on seagrass. I think some of these lessons are very broadly applicable to, to a wide range of, of ecosystems. With a systematic map, um, I use Bez value typology to essentially overlay and understand what different value typologies and what different value indicators are these authors using um, in their approaches to accounting for the value of seagrass ecosystems. Um, as far as I was aware, this was the first study that really used that value typology to try and uh, as a coding framework for a systematic map of, of any ecosystem. Um, which I found really illuminating and interesting and, and something I'll talk about later in the results. In terms of the surveys and interviews, um, I uh, used a kind of a wide range of different methods and, and questions here. Um, but one thing that I really focused on was around this notion of, of citizen participation. So to what degree were these projects actually delegating power and enabling citizen power um, in the conservation of these, these, these areas and, and of these marine resources. And then ultimately reflecting on leadership as well. Um, this was a task that I was given as part of the masters and um, really was, was aimed at trying to provide additional insight and information to my placement host, Blue Ventures, um, and understanding how do we enable leadership on the ground by including different and diverse valuation approaches. So to dig into the results here, um, in terms of the systematic map, uh, there was a very wide geographic range. So really um, all around the world here, um, there has been an increase in interest in seagrass, seagrass in general, but seagrass ecosystem service valuation over the past 30 years. Um, there was obviously a huge spike in 2020, which I don't know if that was because uh, of a, a great pandemic productivity among the, the authors, or if it was if it was related to a, a spike in interest, um, probably a bit of both. Um, and then in terms of, of actually looking at, at how these ecosystems were valued, um, the majority of them were valued in tandem with other ecosystems. So many of them were, were looking at, at um, seagrass plus mangroves plus coral reefs and not necessarily just seagrass, which I found interesting. Um, the majority of studies were looking at provisioning and regulating ecosystem services. So that can be anything from um, carbon sequestration to fisheries benefits. Um, and the majority were looking at that direct use. So not looking at the sort of non-use or optional use, but, but really focusing and, and honing in on, on that, that direct use of how those, those ecosystems are, are directly affecting people. And the most utilized valuation methods uh, among these studies included market price, replacement cost, and willingness to pay and benefits transfer. Um, I apologize in advance for this absolutely horrific graphic, um, but you can just see here just how much overemphasized market price was over basically any other valuation method, um, but, but really was, was the main focus of many of these papers. And then looking at the IFBES value typologies. So this is where I found it to be kind of most interesting in, in using that as a coding framework. Um, the majority of studies, as you can imagine, were focused on biophysical and monetary value indicators with only 9% focusing on sociocultural value indicators. Um, the majority were looking at sort of instrumental values. So again, those values that are sort of more measurable, more tangible versus the more intrinsic and, and relational values um, among uh, within, these, within these ecosystems. And then in the IPAS uh, report, you also have this notion of, of broad values. So not, um, not necessarily things, again, that are measurable. And, and I believe, you know, this was probably a very subjective judgment as to whether these 
or assessing um, these different elements, but, but the majority were focusing on the values such as prosperity, livelihood, you know, again, aligning to sort of more monetary indicators um, versus belong health um, or, or in, sorry, including belonging and health um, with less of a focus on sort of these more intangible notions of, of our relationship with nature, such as stewardship and responsibility or, or oneness and, and harmony with nature. And then in terms of, of knowledge systems that were being utilized, um, you know, this, this, it comes as no surprise, I suppose, that, that academic was, of course, used in 100% of the academic studies. Um, yeah, of course, of course, that would be true. Um, but local knowledge systems were only incorporated in about 30% of the studies um, and indigenous knowledge systems in, in about 3% of the studies or those that at least made explicit reference to this. Um, so really indicating that, that I think seagrass is following the sort of traditional route of many of the other valuation of, of blue carbon ecosystems um, and, and really is, is, is focusing a lot on, on the, the notion of values that are, are easier to measure, are monetary, um, and are often coming from more academic knowledge, views, knowledge systems and, and worldviews. And then in terms of worldviews as well, um, really a focus on, on anthropocentric worldviews rather than this more ecocentric perspective of, of understanding nature as having an inherent value um, in, in and of its own right. Um, to get into the survey results, so this was again a survey with 60 conservation professionals um, that I did in tandem with this systematic review. So again, a very wide range of kind of global and ecological coverage here. Um, the majority of those survey respondents were working in mangrove ecosystems or fisheries and seagrass with others working in, in terrestrial environments as well. The majority were using Carbon, the carbon storage calculation or productivity method to value their ecosystem services with fewer participatory approaches identified. And in here, you can see that there was a focus on, in terms of the project success metrics, um, there was really high focus on sort of biodiversity metrics and economic metrics uh, with 38% indicating the use of um, sociocultural metrics, which was a great thing to see that people are at least thinking of, of those indicators in addition to the biodiversity monitoring as well. In terms of, of community participation, um, this one was interesting in, in seeing that the majority of survey respondents were consulting, uh, consulting people sort of towards the beginning of the project, but not necessarily involving them or co-creating it with them throughout the entire project, um, and and yeah, essentially essentially reflecting this this uh, lack of of citizen power and citizen control in in some of these projects. So to go on to the discussion, I'll I'll talk a bit about sort of the different opportunities and challenges for valuing, financing, and implementing nature based solutions in in these seagrass ecosystems in particular. So one of the one of the clear kind of outcomes or one of the clear um, uh, pieces that was relayed to me again and again through interviews and surveys was the importance of telling the human story for for investors. Um, as you can see from from this graphic from Finance Earth, um, really the 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 different carbon um, verification standards such as Plan Vivo that are explicitly incorporating community co benefits in addition to biodiversity benefits and carbon benefits that are not just emphasizing carbon benefits are ultimately have a, a lower share of the volume, but have a much higher average price per sale of a credit. Um, and as experts noted, uh, saying that more and more people are willing to drill into what goes into each credit and that investors are looking for those high quality products. So that diverse valuation approach enabled many of these projects to talk to their, their, um, their methodology and talk to what they were doing beyond just the carbon price tag. But also the importance of telling the human story for local people and places. Um, there were really many excellent examples in the literature. Um, one of my favorites is from this article from, from Kittinger et al., which is actually not to do with seagrass, it's to do with, with coral restoration. 
Um, but they basically monitored and measured the, the success of a coral restoration project based on cultural value indicators. So this project resulted in, in high personal gratification in strengthened community relationships and revitalized Hawaiian cultural practices. So in, in addition to biodiversity benefits, um, and in this notion, this is the notion of, of crowding in intrinsic motivations to, to participate in, um, in, in PES projects. This is a, a really good source from Poe, Norman, and Levin. Um, so looking at, at sort of the different elements of understanding uh, different value indicators and, and how they relate to things such as governance and access and, and livelihood dynamics as well. In terms of, of other value opportunities, so diverse valuation approaches really were shown in, in a lot of the surveys and, and across the, the literature as well to increase investability, uh, credibility, and, and local buy-in. So really seeing valuation as a social practice that in turn make realities that, that matter, um, I think is a really important notion for us to keep in mind um, as conservation project managers, developers, implementers. Uh, as one survey responded and noted, uh, this demonstration of economic value is a double-edged sword. When it's high, it helps disempowered communities. When it's low, it can be used as a legal weapon against them. So in this particular instance, they were discussing about how um, basically a, a very, very low carbon price was actually given for a particular ecosystem. And that enabled project developers to say, well, let's just take all out all of these mangroves and plant or and have hotels instead. Um, so because of that low carbon price, it actually it actually resulted in in um, sort of a, a perverse benefit or a perverse outcome for for this project, which is I think an important piece to to keep in mind. In terms of, of financing opportunities, um, you know, I thought it was really interesting the intense focus across the literature and the project management and project implementation on the carbon financing for seagrass when many of the experts and, and much of the, the literature as well talks about how this is probably not the best answer for seagrass. Um, there are carbon moratoriums beginning in many, many countries across the world. Um, and in this case, it might be a notion where the market are, are moving ahead of the policy. Um, and according to this report by the United Nations Environment Program, the uh, the carbon financing is unlikely to support small scale PES projects because profit will only be likely in a scenario where the ecosystem is scaled to over a thousand hectares, a, hard, a high carbon price is commanded and startup and verification costs are met separately. So really conservationists must be attuned to the conditions under which PES can either crowd out or crowd in intrinsic motivations which will require explicit engagement with moral, spiritual, and cultural values. In terms of other finance opportunities, um, the interview and survey results demonstrated the possibility of using carbon as an ancillary benefit while focusing on other values for seagrass. So some projects integrated seagrass PES by estimating carbon storage potential for investors while clarifying that investors are not buying an offset but rather investing in a community conservation project with a likely carbon benefit. In terms of implementation and, and monitoring opportunities for these projects, um, projects are becoming easier to validate geospatially. Um, and there has been a huge move to kind of, of course, with AI as well, to be able to monitor these projects geospatially. But I think there's a concern among professionals that, um, and, and many local communities, I'm sure, that this will then even further remove the value of these ecosystems and the way in which we engage with the value of these ecosystems from the communities. Um, and I enjoyed this quote a lot from the IPES uh, a respondent who was one of the IPES report authors who says, um, I often get asked, how do we make money on nature-based solutions? And I answer that not all those values can have a price tag put on them. And people start to look puzzled because we're introducing a new worldview, but how we assess values and how we integrate them into decision-making needs to be more context specific, dependent on actors involved and depending on the outcomes we want to achieve. In terms of, of um, this point, I think is really important in integrating local values and, and knowledge systems to ensure citizen control. 
Um, so these examples abound, I think, around the world now where more and more uh, traditional cultural practices are being integrated into marine management frameworks, making sure that these frameworks are relevant to the communities that steward these ecosystems. Um, but again, having to really deeply engage with the values of, of people who, who are in these places um, and not just necessarily saying we want to protect this ecosystem because it's worth X amount of money. So ultimately, um, I wanted to end with kind of five recommendations that I synthesized from these, these three different methods. So the, the systematic map, the surveys and, and the interviews um, to try and, and have a bit of reflection and, and happy to, to you know, take feedback on this and, and, and answer any questions on this. But I think these were the sort of five key points that I pulled from this research and that I found really interesting and, and helpful. Um, the first was asking, a question, nature-based solutions to, to what? Solving society for whom? Um, there's a, you know, a huge increase in interest in nature-based solutions and nature-based solutions financing and nature-based solutions projects. And I think that we often forget that the, the huge sort of um, swath of, of different things that fall under nature-based solutions and this this terminology in and of itself has been critiqued for kind of removing humans from nature and talking about humans as if we are doing things to nature but i think nature-based solutions has also enabled a really um a, a common language for project developers for investors for communities to be able to speak to the value of nature um, but i think asking these two questions is still really critical um, because nature-based solutions are, are really, you know, the part that everyone leaves off at the end is, is the solving of societal challenges. Um, and I think this one statistic is interesting in terms of uh, many countries still today don't recognize the combined mitigative and adaptive power of nature-based solutions. Um, and I think that that is, is really indicative of this focus on, on carbon uh, sequestration and the the sad fact that many of these ecosystems work as coastal protection, but that is not a value that is being translated into um, into the market and 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 being investable essentially. Um, this I think is is was an interesting point that came from several several respondents and also a, a few sources in the literature is beginning projects with participatory mapping of seagrass ecosystem services. So. Um, really conducting this through through trust building, through a ranked choice, and through mapping. So working with communities to identify the areas that are most important to these communities, um, and then trying to understand where is it appropriate to potentially look at at monetary valuation methods, and where is it appropriate to look at more storytelling methods, where we're communicating what we're doing to investors but we're not necessarily just putting a carbon or putting a, a price on, on this project. And then in terms of um, using these uh, to, to also using these identified ecosystem services to align to the values of investors. Um, so moving away from this notion of, of capital to a more diverse understanding of value and making these other values valuable. Um, I think not just focusing on one element of value, but but working with communities to integrate and talk about what are the values that in, are important and, and how can these values be more accessibly monitored? So meaning, how are you actually engaging communities in the monitoring of these values? Um, conducting surveys or qualitative interviews perhaps would be more, more um, easy and accessible for communities than, than doing carbon storage calculations in seagrass beds. And I just wanted to highlight this one resource, um, which I found incredibly useful and, and something perhaps that all interested in, in doing any sort of ecosystem valuation work in blue, blue carbon or blue ecosystems in general. Um, this is the, the blue value website and and it's it's free and accessible to anyone and basically lays out all of the different valuation approaches that are in existence in in term for for marine ecosystems um, and gives some some advice and and some additional resources for conservation practitioners interested in in actually utilizing them um, and also some some additional caveats and points to be aware of with this um, this is a fantastic database and, and one that I found immensely useful in this research. 
Um, and then in, in terms of the fourth point here, engaging communities in, in project monitoring. So providing investors perhaps with a menu of metrics to choose from as selected by local communities um, and incorporating storytelling metrics. So again, not just focusing on the, the numbers, but what is the story you're trying to tell um, and, and how does the story reflect the values of, of local communities? And then ultimately moving from blue carbon to blue value or, or whatever you want to call it, but not just focusing on carbon for seagrass, given that it's it's perhaps likely um, going to be an, an infeasible solution for small scale projects. Um, and really this, this notion of bundling seagrass perhaps under other carbon projects or estimating carbon storage in, in sale of, of um, you know, a blue value credit but emphasizing that this is this is going towards other values, um, and the purchases will support and engage community communities in, in monitoring of those values. So um, that's pretty much the end, and and wanted to just kind of conclude here with a, a final a final kind of thought and and reflection on a simple question: is you know how can we use our values to make nature valuable? Um, I think that there is. I'm, you know, again, I started this presentation, if you weren't there, by saying I'm, I'm not a seagrass expert, this is not my area of expertise, but, you know, really enjoyed diving into this world for a year during my master's and, um, you know, found it really fascinating and I think really has challenged me as a conservation professional, um, you know, working in the field to, to be braver about communicating the values that matter. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, if we're only talking about ecosystems in terms of their monetary benefit, then that is what the investors are going to see and that is what the rest of the world is going to see. Um, and reflecting on um, you know, a final quote that I love very much by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who says, we need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but also for our relationship to the world. Um, and I think by, by openly discussing the values that we have as conservation professionals, the values that we have and why we do this work, why do communities value these ecosystems, um, to step towards reminding us about our connections to the natural world and why nature is so important for us, not just because of the monetary price tag that it carries. So um, yeah, I think that was a, um, for me, a very personally important reflection from, from this research and really, really enjoyed this entire process. So thank you very much everyone for, for your attention. Um, I think we have yeah, plenty of time for Q and A and everything. Um, I wanted to also thank my, my co-authors, Ryan Lewis and, and Julian Clifton and placement host Blue Ventures for, for being part of this, this research. Uh, this article has just is currently under peer review um, with the Journal of Ecosystem Services, and I would be very happy to distribute it to the attendees whenever it is published. Um, but if you wanted to reach me uh, outside of that for any reason, um, here's my, my email at the top and um, my LinkedIn as well, and I can I can put that in the chat. So um, yeah, thank you very much for for attending, and um, looking forward to all your comments. Okay, thank you, Chloe. That was great. We really appreciate you sharing all this research with us. All right, let's see. Um, we I just want to remind everyone we can uh, if you want to post your questions in the question panel or the chat, um, we can go ahead and use this remaining time for. Um, uh, discussing them with Chloe. Okay, so um, a question that came in early on, um, could you talk a little bit more about who was surveyed for the survey? Was it the authors and researchers of the literature that was assessed or members of the communities they worked with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry if, if you maybe came in halfway through or that wasn't that wasn't very clear, but um, basically um, at the time I was in uh, the Cambridge Conservation um, Initiative, which is the CCI based in Cambridge, and it's the headquarters for many of the NGOs based in, in the UK. Um, so I sent out this survey through listservs, um, contacted basically everyone that worked in the building, and then additionally the projects that they were also implementing. Um, so it was, yeah, very much Cambridge focused, but then it was sort of snowball sampled out to many other survey um, respondents in via LinkedIn and, and, and others. So basically you just had to identify as a conservation professional um, working within, within this field and not necessarily seagrass, it could have been any other ecosystem. So um, the survey was really wide and open and I, and, I, and I did that explicitly for the purpose of 
understanding that seagrass science is very new um, and it's 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 still evolving. And I wanted to get kind of a wider perspective on how other um, marine ecosystem projects are are being monitored and and managed and um, and valued. So 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 yeah, that was um, kind of a wide open open survey for for many people. Thank you, Chloe. Um, I, and I wanted to thank everyone who's posted really great resources in the chat. Um, if anybody wants to receive a um, copy of the chat to get those resources, just um, shoot me, Sarah, at octogroup.org uh, an email, and I can provide that. But it does look like some great resources. Um, a question um, from the chat. Um, what would the estimated time frame be for the participatory mapping phases based on your research? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and um, you know, again, uh, not being a seagrass <laughs> expert, and, and really just having having done a, a, a lot of research within this in that in that year, um, I I would definitely refer you, and I'm happy to share this PowerPoint um, when when done. I would refer to the paper. Um, let me see if I can find it. It's in the PowerPoint, but um, basically, it was it was several of the survey respondents noted that this was something that they did, and it was also very well documented within this paper. Um, which was from, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to mispronounce this name, but I'll, I'll put it in the chat just now. Um, and, and I would highly recommend taking a look at that, at that paper where they talked about participatory mapping of ecosystem services. Um, and they give you a much more detailed breakdown that I, that I ever could um, to be able to, to, to kind of take a look at that. And, um, and it just found that, that that was something that was, I think, really, really effective and, and also something I think to emphasize that many people talked about, you know, again, in that notion of just consulting versus um, versus actually co-managing and co-creating co a project, um, you know, that that map might change, you know, it might not just be the map at the beginning and then the map at the end, but it might be something that, that really shifts over time. Um, and so I think having those those. Uh, abilities to to take a pause and and to talk with communities and and say okay how has this map shifted um, you know how is it different now than it was than it was six months ago I think was was another something that that I really noticed from the literature that a lot of people um, that a lot of people noted as well so I'll just put this um, the name in the in the chat here of the the paper okay thank you Chloe um, let me know when you're ready for a question no yeah good okay. Okay. Did the survey take into account the funding source for the project, which often defines the size and scope of the ability to implement? That's an excellent question. I think if I'm remembering correctly, um, yes, I asked what what was the what where was this project primarily funded or how how was it primarily funded, um, such as through um, yeah, was it was were the, the startup and development costs met separately um, from you know from a donor potentially, or was this sort of grassroots funding? I believe I, I had that question in there um, that I think I mentioned more in the paper that that will hopefully come out soon. Um, but I think that is a really important point to highlight and and one that that I think was was quite interesting in a lot of the the, the carbon projects in particular, and that many of them had to have. A, a huge initial investment, you know, we're talking potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars to actually verify these projects. And if you don't necessarily have that from a, a donor or you don't have a project that's willing to kind of match that, that, that funding and that ability early on, um, then you're in a really tricky position where you're not able to necessarily fund fund that project. Um, so yeah, I'd have to I'd have to go back and look at the at the paper, but I think that was um, that was a really important point that that you're right drastically affects the kind of ability of these projects to to be effectively um, effectively done and 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 whether or not carbon financing is a is a is a feasible thing for them. Sarah, sorry. Well, so, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so this is, I think, a follow-on um, to the, the pre what you were the previous question. Um, and if you 
it's as important as values are, funders can't monetize values without getting into a morass of identity politics. How are you proposing to address that? Because without that, you'll not be able to significantly include values into funding. Yeah, no, really, really interesting. Um, it's interesting something of a statement more than a question, to be honest. So yeah. uh, if um, we can leave it at that, or if you have anything more you want to add. Yeah, I mean, just to say this, I mean, I think I think this was my this is a huge dilemma I had when when writing this paper. It was like, OK, we really only have, you know, there's uh, in the in the very famous paper of Costenza et al. I think in 1998, where they first estimated the the global value of ecosystem services. Um, you know, that was that was a really uh, powerful paper. And 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 one of the quotes that they said, um, I'll, I'll, I'll misquote it, but it said something like, you know, one of the things that we don't have a choice, or, or we basically don't have a choice not to monetize and, va and value these ecosystem services, um, or essentially that the only choice we have is to mon monetize and value these ecosystem services. And I think that that was a really interesting statement and, and one that I think has really reflected upon a lot of the, the ecosystem service literature and practitioners over the past, um, over the past 20 years, really. And I just wonder what would it look like if that that question or that that statement was kind of reversed if we were starting with a more diverse and holistic understanding of values um, and then saying whether or not it is appropriate to monetize or or to try and communicate the monetary benefit of these values. Um, so I guess my my question is or my my point is not necessarily we should never mon monetarily value ecosystem services. I think in some circumstances, in some places, it's really important and can really communicate the value. But um, as one respondent said, it, it can be a double-edged sword. It can be not right in that context. It can crowd out other intrinsic motivations to participate in these projects. Um, so, so yeah, so I think it's more of just a, a warning and saying that there are, you know, there are so many diverse valuation methods that can be used nowadays that can be better for communities to participate that can be more reflective of local community values. Um, so I think it's it's not a choice of, or, or it should be a choice of whether we choose to, monet to monetarily value these, these ecosystem services or not. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Um, another question, mangroves are highly biodiverse environments, which perhaps offer the greatest number of ecosystem services of any type of ecosystem that comes to mind. So I'm not surprised by the results and the great number of academic studies focusing on valuation of this diverse set, set of ecosystem services. Do you think the results would be different for other types of ecosystems? And maybe they meant seagrass initially? Yeah, I think if I'm if I'm understanding this question correctly, um, I think that the, so something interesting I think about mangroves is that, is that they, I, I, I don't say they're easier to measure like carbon uh, sequestration values, but but it's a science that has been developed more, you know, for a longer period of time. There's been more interest in these ecosystems, um, but we're also beginning to see kind of more perverse as aspects of of that monetary valuation of of carbon sequestration. Um, so I think that that mangroves and seagrasses, in 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 a similar way, offer a hugely diverse range of, of ecosystem services that that can be valued and by valued I don't mean put up as indicating the values of these ecosystems um, and one um, one project in in Kenya that I that I interviewed and spoke with talked about how um, they were the ones that were trying to, to have seagrass be sort of an ancillary benefit to um, to these mangrove projects um, but also noted sort of community confusion as to why carbon was so important. You know, there were when they were first engaging communities with this project, they were saying, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna monetize and, and value your carbon." And people there were like, "Oh, okay, great. You know, take take my carbon. Why is why does this matter to me?" Um, and and very few few community members could actually be involved in the monitoring of this project um, because they needed a bachelor's degree. So I think having the, the notion part of this value ecosystems helps to engage in these and other monitoring aspects of these projects um, helps to 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 really diversify the the types of approaches that you can take to, to demonstrating the importance of, of an ecosystem. 
Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Chloe. Um, another question. Do you have any ideas, considering the complexities of coastal carbon methodologies compared to terrestrial, and that no one yet has managed to certify a seagrass project, I think, under Vera or Plan Vivo, um, if there are any other funding mechanisms that could provide alternatives to the carbon market and which would more fully realize these wider values? Such a good question. Thanks, Madeline. Um, and yeah, I think I think this is a this is the key. This is like the the number one question that I think we're all asking. Um, as far as I know, I think that there's only one verified um, carbon project. I don't know what under what carbon standard or carbon seagrass project I should say, which is in the Virginia Coastal Reserve, um, and that's a really fascinating case study in that you know how how massive, how big, how much money has to be invested in a project to make it feasible and. Um, I think that was really illuminating to me as well, that, that that was really the first and only one that has come online so far. Um, but anyone in the audience, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that. Um, you know, I think the, the challenge that I think was really interesting that I didn't know about before conducting this research was um, the notion that, that, there, that you cannot have sort of a carbon verification standard and a biodiversity verification standard on the sort of same project because you're essentially double counting the benefits, which I think is a really challenging um, thing to, to, to think about because obviously we want to be tracking biodiversity metrics um, and we want to be understanding these metrics, but we're not necessarily able to look both at that and carbon and, and potentially monetize those things. Um, I think the the private sector investment in nature based solutions is really interesting. It's a really um, it's a hugely growing area, um, and and I think you know will be growing, continuing to grow over the next ten years or so um, in massive ways. And I think that more particularly, um, you know, if you look at the the recent articles that have been coming out of of um, you know, certain carbon standards not complying or, or saying, you know, 90% of the, the, the carbon standards projects were, were debunked or, or we're, not, we're not following regulations. Um, I think that among the private sector investment world, probably more and more of those organizations and companies are looking towards um, moving away from, not necessarily moving away from carbon verification, but looking at more rigorously verified projects and projects that are also going to be, they're going to be able to report back to their boards and say, hey, not only did we potentially offset X amount of carbon, but we also had all of these additional community co-benefits as part of it. Um, so I think the, the, the private sector world is really interesting. Um, I, one other thing I'll say is, is I work in, in sort of the sustainable tourism world. That's kind of my background and expertise rather than, than seagrass. Um, and I think that this, this world is also very, very interesting in that there's a lot of really amazing um, initiatives happening in around the world. Um, Six Senses in the Maldives is the one I know really well, where they're using uh, sort of localized carbon offset programs. But again, they're not calling it an offset. They're saying, you know, there's a likely range that this project is providing for, you know, your trip and, and offering that to guests, but saying what you're to become experts in in um, in seagrass, or you're, you're you're investing in um, in the ability for for biodiversity to rebound in this area. So um, those are the two areas that I see as kind of the most exciting are our tourism operators um, and also private sector investment in nature based solutions more more generally um, is is what I would say in, in terms of of the funding mechanisms. I think are maybe alternatives. Okay, right. thank you, Claire. Um, a comment and question from another uh, attendee. I really enjoyed the presentation and range of studies referenced. I'm curious where the 1,000 hectare minimum size came from for feasibility of a seagrass carbon project. Yeah, totally. I can. Um, I'll I'll send that to you, Sarah, after the um, after this, so that maybe you can send it around with everyone because I thought that was a really amazing report. It was by. The United Nations Environment Program in 2020. Um, so that was not a statistic that I I found or that I I guess created or synthesized through my research. It was it was a, a really well done report by by UNEP in 2020 um, that talked about how um, yeah basically the that seagrass carbon financing is is basically probably infeasible unless you have a high carbon price commanded and you have a, a project scaled to over a thousand hectares. So. 
Um, if I, you could probably just Google it of UNEP 2020 Seagrass restoration or something like that, but I'll, I'll find the report and send it to you, Sarah, so you can send it along um, with, with the other materials as well. Okay, um, and I just let everyone know, um, the if you want a copy of the chat and the other resources that's sort of on a, a please go ahead and request that I, I won't send it to everyone um but I'll, I'll put my email address in the uh, chat in just a minute um okay another question this is an absolutely terrific talk i am from a caribbean sids antigua and barbuda and the issue of scale is something that we are often challenged with most studies are unable to capture the value of our ecosystems due to smaller scales. I'm intrigued by the concept of going from blue carbon to blue values. The question I have is related to how do decision policymakers, politicians, et cetera, view the concept of blue values. It has already been a battle to get them to understand carbon and how it relates to monetary values, which unfortunately is still the financial tool that has the greatest impact when speaking for or against environmental management. How does blue values then fit into this based on the work that you have done? Yeah, really interesting question. Um, and again, I think this is at the center of, of this challenge is, is being able to communicate values in a more broad sense and not necessarily just, just carbon. Um, you know, one, one thing that I think we we often underestimate is is how often policymakers are making decisions based upon moral values rather than just this is going to be beneficial for the economy. Um, I think a lot of times our our politicians and policymakers are making those decisions based on moral judgments and moral values um, and not necessarily just looking at at monetary valuation. Um, so I think it's it's not necessarily a question of of if these people will accept a, an entirely new value framework. Um, really, really, it's the question of how we're we're communicating it and and to what extent we we can communicate those values um, in a different and more diverse way. So I guess my answer to this, which isn't a very um, probably not not a very helpful answer, but I guess. It's really about about what is the context and and what is it, for example, that those politicians or policymakers care about. Um, you know, do they want to see uh, community health improving? Do they want to see um, water quality improving? Do they want to see, um, you know, uh, anything from from coastal protection to to is something carbon something they care about? Um, I think having a diverse value framework and one that you're you're not just focusing on this. Carbon is the only thing that matters. It's the most important thing that matters, um, but really moving towards a, an ability to integrate diverse valuation approaches um, and different valuation approaches for these ecosystems, I think is a really important thing to, to be able to, to emphasize. Um, and, and I think it's very context specific. It's, it's gonna depend on what the community values and what the politicians find um, find valuable in that, in that context. But, but you're right in saying that how, how do you relate this to monetary values and how do you get investors to invest in this when, when we're talking about more diverse values that don't necessarily um, you know, have a monetary price tag? That's the biggest challenge. And I, and I think it's a, it really requires a shift in, in worldview at the end of the day and, and complete perspective um, that's, that's really challenging for us who live in a, a capitalist society focused on, on economic growth and, and monetary incentives. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'd be happy to chat more if you wanted to reach out and, and brainstorm more about that that question because I don't necessarily have the 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 only and right answer. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chloe. Um, there was a comment that Vera and Verified Carbon Standard does incorporate biodiversity and community benefits through its CCB certification, which in some cases has boosted the price of the credit, especially the case for mangrove blue carbon projects. I was just going to put in a plug. Um, I'm right in the middle of scheduling a, um, a webinar on Project Vita Manglar in Colombia, which has both of those certifications um, and uh, about their project. So that we're hoping to have that webinar in March. So um, stay tuned for that coming. Um, another question that's come in, many of the seagrass projects I often hear discussed are focused on tropical warm water environments, the Philippines, Mediterranean, Florida, et cetera. And it seems like there's a gap in studies that looked at cold water seagrass, like the Pacific Northwest and New England coasts in the US. Would you say most of your survey responses came from people working in tropical areas? Do you think there's likely to be any difference in valuation and community receptiveness between warm and cold climates? 
Yeah, really interesting question. Um, I would say definitely there was a focus on tropical areas, um, particularly around around Indonesia and and Thailand and Southeast Asia. Um, but I will say there are some amazing, there is some amazing work going on in in cold water environments, particularly in the UK. Um, Project Seagrass is an amazing NGO that's been working really hard in this space for for a long time and have done some really excellent studies um, based in cold water environments. And um, and yeah, I I interviewed them as well as part of this project, and and they're they're not even you know interested in touching sort of carbon um, carbon verification or carbon um, uh, sequestration as far as I'm aware. Um, you know, really trying to emphasize the role of community being involved in these projects through citizen science apps like their their seagrass spotter app. Um, really trying to to work to 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 work with communities in in this regard. So. Um, yeah, I think that was an, an interesting finding, and, and obviously a lot of their work is funded through, you know, they're, they're an NGO funded through donations, and that's how they're able to finance a lot of this restoration work, but there is a huge kind of community involvement and element on that. Um, and uh, yeah, as far as in the US, I know Virginia is obviously one of the projects that has um, worked in a cold water environment, but um, certainly, I, I I wouldn't be able to say sort of the the difference in what they're emphasizing across um, cold versus warm water, but I think it's a it's a really interesting question. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Um, with, there's a, a it's a question: How can we start measuring cultural assets in nature based solutions? It's interconnected with social and human assets in the sustainable livelihoods framework. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's sort of the the purpose of I guess the paper um in 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 doing this and and trying to emphasize the importance of of understanding cultural benefits um there was another um uh, great paper I'll, I'll I'll try to, to find and, and send along that that talked about um really measuring cultural cultural benefits that that paper by Kittinger et al in 2015 again I'll send I'll, I'll send that maybe as part of some of the resources um, is one of my favorites because it, it wasn't focused on seagrass, but it was focused on on coral restoration and and really communicating what were the cultural benefits that came from this restoration project, um, not just focusing on the biodiversity indicators, but how were traditional Hawaiian cultural practices revived? How were um, you know additional? Uh, how were people's health and uh, improved? How did their connection with nature improve? All these things, um, and that certainly all connects under the the sustainable livelihoods framework. Um, and the notion that we we can't just understand natural capital, but we have to look at social capital and human capital and and financial as well. So um, yeah, I think the 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 more diversity and the values that we measure, the better. Um, not only because we're communicating uh, you, you know more effectively the success of a project, but those those are the values that ultimately can resonate with communities rather than just saying you know this tree is worth X amount of money because of carbon when carbon isn't a metric that matters to people on the ground it matters to us most of us in the global north who um, you know want to offset our emissions or the companies based here so yeah so I I, I hope that kind of answers your question. All right, Chloe, thank you so much. Um, we've gotten to most of the questions and some of the uh, remaining questions are a little more technical. Um, so I just want to say you've got a tremendous number of kudos in the chat. So this was really a, a really important project to undertake and we're very glad you did it and um, that you're sharing it both in, through publication and in this way. Um, and we really appreciate all everyone who was very participatory in, in the chat and sharing resources as part of this webinar. Um, so thank you all. And we will be having some, um, as I mentioned, we'll be having uh, the mangrove themed webinar hopefully in March um, to talk about some work going on in, in Colombia. Um, but thank you again, Chloe. I think you'll be following up or I will be once the paper is published to make that available for everyone. And um, in addition, all the people who've emailed me or put in the chat that they wanted to get the resources from this webinar, I'll follow up with you. Um, thank you, Chloe, again for sharing this and we hope to have you on to talk about your tourism research when that's ready. And thank you everyone for participating today. Um, we hope yeah, that thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Sarah, the opportunity and thanks all for attending. Um, really enjoyed sharing this research and we'll share, share it all when it's published. Okay, wonderful. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thanks.